2.30 session, Teaching Writing. Um, we're looking so lucky today to welcome both uh, Liam and Janae here, who are both fantastic authors and really do a great job of bringing their skill set to capturing the environments and the nature and the spaces around them. And they both have such wonderful, diverse experience to share with you what it's like to not only use those skills to write their own collections, but also um, to help other people learn how to write and how to capture the beauty around them and turn that into narrative. Janae has such a great collection of photography from all of her travels, um, which is just monumental to look at, so please do visit her website and check that out. And Liam, who also captures wonderful, wonderful place, um, teaches writing at UW. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for us to learn a little bit more from the pros about how to turn our ideas and our passions and those sparks into the written word on paper. Join me in welcoming William and Janae. Uh, we were discussing earlier that the, the initial design for this panel had been uh, teaching, about the teaching of writing, but then there was another poster that went up that said tips and tricks about writing, so we decided it was going to be a little bit of both. I think we decided that. We did, unless you want to hear one or the other. Well, we, maybe we'll just kind of come up along. Okay. Works for me. Uh, can we maybe start with our origin stories? Like how you Absolutely. came to be a writer and for that matter a teacher? Barbie. <laughs> I, I, at age four, started writing. I know I was ahead of myself. Writing sagas for my Barbie dolls <laughs> with <laughs> friends in the neighborhood. And it just kept going on. Uh, fast forward to third grade. I had a third grade teacher who terrified me absolutely terrified me and she assigned us to write a short story about something you know about trick number one or tip right. number one write about what you know so i wrote about a shepherd in the desert <laughs> about which i know nothing and i'm writing and i'm writing and remember those big thick yeah. ruled and the thick pencils and so I suddenly realized I've gone through 20 pages and the teacher is standing over me and the entire class is staring at me. And she says, are you done yet? And I thought, oh, she's going to kill me. I, I'm dead. This is it. I'm going to have to repeat third grade. The next day, she handed back everybody's but mine and called me up to the front of the room and made me stand there as I prayed for the floorboards to open up and for me to just descend. And she said, boys and girls, we have a future author standing no. in front of the classroom. Wow. Needless to say, I was no longer terrified mm -hmm. of this wow. teacher. And that sort of set me on my, um, my path. Uh, really fast forward, um, graduate school and then um, uh, I taught writing at the University of um, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and then I took a job as um, director of the writing program at Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. And I taught a lot of writing. Keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and at Rochester Institute of Technology, there is a college called the Eastman School of Photography. Mm -hmm. This is important because as director of the um, writing program, my class was always at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, which meant I had photography students. And because that was their one hour free to take mm -hmm. liberal arts courses. I got to be friends with everybody in photography. And they started looking at my images. And they said, why are you teaching writing? Why are you not out in the field? So I went on a photo shoot to Zimbabwe. My first photo shoot. This is somewhat insane. But um, while I was there, the Sangoma, who is um, a, a seer and a healer and for the endobelly, um, he said, let me throw the bones for you. So I'm holding the bones, okay. He said, really concentrate on your problems. I'm like, I don't have any problems. I'm living my life. I identify as an academic. I am doing exact. Concentrate on your problems. So I concentrate on my problems. I throw the bones. He said, you did not concentrate on your problems. 
So um, I take the bones back, I'm really concentrating, and he says, okay, I know you're an English teacher. I know you teach writing. This was very Twilight Zone. Because I had not told him or anyone on the crew this. And so I throw the bones, and uh, he says, your problem is you want to be a writer and a photographer. And so the next year, my second photo shoot, I was on the Mosquito Coast in Honduras. I was on a narrow gauge train and um, riding along the coast, being eaten alive by mosquitoes. <laughs> and I saw something out of the corner of my eye. And I was at this point um, documenting the lives of women and children at work around the world. And um, so I look off to the side and I say to my fixer, what is that? There was this woman doing this. He said, do you want to find out? So he taps the engineer and he, they slow the train. I thought they'd stop. We leap off the train and go off into the jungle. I'm watching the train leave. I said, what's the next train? Four days from now. Okay. Um, and at that moment, as I flew off the train, it was a literal and metaphorical moment for me. And that was when I decided I am right now doing what I want to do. And that's to be a photojournalist. And I went home and I resigned my tenure. Wow. And became a photojournalist. And from there, gallery shows. And I would um, write up the stories of my the people I would document. And they would be put in catalogs. And from there, I started writing short stories. Discovered I am a lousy short story writer. Tried to make novellas. Uh, Novellas don't sell. And so I wrote my first novel. And um, that's my story. Wow. <laughs> I you want you to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> that's on a cliffhanger. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how it all works. I like that that you literalized taking the leap. It's like you backed yeah. off the train. I did. And I really was eaten alive. I mean, mosquito bites. <laughs> Everywhere. From they were horrible. I think, well that kind of answers my other question, which was that we were going to bat back and forth because we were originally talking about teaching writing and I was going to ask, can writing be taught? And I felt my answer to that is that writing can be taught, but most of the teaching is self-taught. Like you have, I think we can give each other the tools. And it sounds like that was the case for you. Like you were given all this information, you had that wonderful inspiring teacher early on, but at the end of the day, you were the one who had to kind of take the leap and figure out what you were all about and where your stories lay. So. That's very exciting. I'm trying to think if it happened to me like that. I actually have a fact checker in the audience, Tom Sanford, who's with us today from New York City, um, who was my college roommate. So he can he can confirm or deny anything. And there's I'm the saying. whole thing. Yes. Uh, I don't have I don't have any leaping from trains. And <laughs> my third grade. It's a good thing. My third grade yeah. teacher. I'm trying to remember my third grade teacher. I don't think was into. Um, well, there were plenty of cliffhangers in my life with teachers delivered. <coughs> that I remember copying down sentences each day. The teacher would write a sentence on the board and we would copy down for penmanship. And one day the teacher wrote on the board, Liam has a baby sister. And I said, I don't have a baby sister. And I was like, wait, mom wasn't at breakfast. Oh, she's at the hospital having a baby. So I was not necessarily born to be a writer because I was not necessarily observant of the area. <laughs> I've learned since then. And I do have a sister, it turns out. So, you know, she's still with us today. <laughs> And, uh, but I, I was always definitely, I grew up in a writer's house. My mom and dad were great writers and storytellers. And so that influenced me quite a bit. And then when I got to school, I realized it was the thing I was least worst at, uh, as far as it wasn't, math was not my forte, science not so much. But writing, I could definitely spin a sentence or two. And, uh, but when I graduated from college and I went down to Washington, D.C. to live, uh, because my future bride was living there, I spent some time with my uncle, who's been a carpenter for about 45, maybe going on 50 years. And I was living in their house rent-free, and uh, he said, so what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to be a writer. And he said, but you're going to get a job, Bob, right? <laughs> and that sadly took me by surprise almost as much as that third grade sentence. I was like, Liam has a baby sister. I was like, I need a job. Liam needs a job. We could have written that on the board. Um, and so I didn't look up. And so the next thing I did, I went down to a temp agency, and then I went and worked for 
a nonprofit, and then I worked for an advertising agency, and then finally for uh, a corporation where I did all sorts of public relations writing. And all the time, I would sit around the table and think, like, I'm not sure I should be here. I know I'm writing, but I'm not writing the great American novel. So one day, when my boss was getting ready to promote me to a big position, uh, I said, you know what, I think it's better off if I actually quit at this point, because I want to write the great American novel. And he was like, oh, this is such a bad idea. Lee. No, he didn't. He said, good luck to you. Uh, be kind to all of us. And, uh, <laughs> and so I quit, and I lasted about two weeks at home trying to write the great American novel, because I realized I needed, I come out of the corporate world, and I needed structure, and I needed people around me. And so I signed up for an MFA program at George Mason University, which definitely professionalized my writing, gave me things to work for and work towards. And one of the program uh, stories that I wrote there, which was set in Alaska and it concerns World War II, the very waning days when Japan was tying uh, bombs, incendiary bombs, to giant paper balloons and letting them float across the ocean. Uh, and then when they arrived in the United States, all their arrivals already hushed up. I found an actual historical report of one very interesting balloon that landed and in the wreckage was documented there was a postcard from a boy to his father written in Japanese. And I thought, well, how did that postcard get there? And from that grain of sand, the novel was born. Right. And, uh, but I think when I, when I always reflect on what would made my writing career possible, I think it was some tenacity on my part, but also much more understanding on the part of those around me, not just my college roommate, but also the woman who later foolishly married me and has supported me through a writing life, but also my uncle and all of my family who said, Yes, go, go try it, dream big. And so, as a teacher today, I find that's my job. I try to be, I'm not a roadblock person, I'm a catalyst. I'm saying like, this is what you do, I want to meet you where you are, if you want to write about this, then I'm going to try and figure out a way to help you write about that, and then get that writing out into the world. That seems to me to be the important thing to do as a teacher, and it's been the thing that's most gratifying. So I'm not sure like I can teach them like which word goes next, I don't think anyone can do that. But I can teach them to trust that they will know which word comes next when the word, next word comes. Exactly. And I have gone to the other end. Um, for a number of years, I led roundtables um, of critique groups for Red Bird Writing and then Red Oak Writing in mm -hmm. Milwaukee. Um, if you don't know, Milwaukee has an incredibly vibrant writing community, <laughs> um, both at the university and not at the university. And uh, so we have these roundtable critique groups, which have all gone virtual now. And um, what's really terrific about that is there are writers from all over the country who are able to be part of these writing groups. Um, and so I did that for a number of years. And what I discovered is I was so into it and spending so much time nurturing adults who were finding their way to writing that I was leaving my writing on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in 2016, I finally said, you know, that Sangoma would kill me right mm -hmm. now. I really <laughs> need to uh, get back to my creative. So I stepped down from these roundtable critique groups that I was leading and uh, started, wrote three books, four books actually. Uh, so, Do you find that have different parts of your brain, teaching and writing, or is it the same, same loop? Not that I know anything about neuroscience. So. You know, I, when I read my students, and I'm calling them students for lack of a better word, like my people's writing. Um, this was my problem. I would spend a day doing these roundtable critique groups, and then I would go home, and I would have their stories in my mm. head. And I have just so much room in my head mm. for this stuff. And I would continue to think about their stuff, and I'd be sending them emails saying, well, I know I gave you critique, but I've been thinking about it more. And have you thought of? And this could be an opportunity for. And I was just sapping myself dry. There's a, there's a Stephen King quote 
that I often like to think of, which is that teaching is like hooking jumper cables up to your head. Yes. I think about that a lot. Not because my <laughs> students are drained, but just the act of teaching yes. can be very exhausting, even though some people think, like, oh, teaching, all you do is just kind of stand in front of the class or sit on the desk. I'm a big sitter on the desk person. And, uh, but it's a lot, because you really invest yourselves. In your, if you're doing it right, you really invest yourself a lot in the students' work. And it doesn't shut down. No, it doesn't. Hmm. Uh, you, you don't clock out. Exactly. And you just keep going. And that was my problem. And that had been years before when I gave up my tenure. And which is an insane thing to do. <laughs> you know, yeah. Talk about a leap of faith. Um, but, I, you know, a creative life, living the life of a creative for me, because I'm doing photography and writing, mm. um, just didn't leave a lot in my soul for also teaching. I'm really curious as to how those two different arts inform each other, photography and writing. Well, it helps if you write about a photographer. There. <laughs> uh. But, uh, in addition to that, um, I find that a number of my images actually um, have helped me create the, my main character. Um, and I also um, use my experiences as a photographer, like being medevaced out of the Kalahari Desert, mm -hmm and um, having my lodge in Namibia burned down around me. Um, I, I've had some incredible experiences. Or <laughs> having a green, a black mamba slithered. Oh. <laughs> I hate snakes. <laughs> and um, saying, OK, Janine, the best way to deal with your fear of snakes is to photograph it. And my fixer said, uh, they have a potent neurotoxin, one wet bite, and you're dead in 15 minutes. I'm like, but I gotta get the shot. Um, I did get the shot. Um, and that's in another book. And you didn't get bit. And I did not get bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I did finally leave in a hurry. So um, a lot of my experiences and a lot of my images have found their way into my books. Is it the same approach to art making when you are taking a photograph, I mean, I know nothing about photography, but are you trying to capture when you, your eye, is it looking for a story, is it looking for a composition, and is that the same like when you sit down and write a paragraph? Yeah, it's exactly the same. And the other thing that I find is, um, you know, with a camera, you're not only looking for composition, you're looking for the correct meter, you're looking um, how you want to zoom in, and so I, um, I'll sometimes get lost in the zooming in in the mm -hmm. writing and go digging deep into character and um, the zooming in on a cheetah um, in Zimbabwe when I was, was last there. So there I find a lot of overlapping connections. And, uh, but I try not to do the two things at the same time. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I cannot write when I'm on a photo shoot. Really? And why do you think? Because it's just a, one set of creative batteries and drain. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And it is, when I'm on a photo shoot, it, I'm up at 5 a.m. and I'm going to bed at maybe midnight. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm on. Right. And uh, when I write, I start writing. I'll read what I wrote yesterday, and then I'll actually start writing at 9 or 10 in the morning, and I'll go till midnight. Really? Yeah, I write in these massive spurts. So I typically finish a draft in, um, and my drafts are not real drafty drafts. They're pretty far along. Mm -hmm. um, the book I'm working on right now, which is set in Zimbabwe, a place I know well, um, I wrote in seven weeks. Wow. Oh. So. so are you, we were talking briefly outside about plotting versus pantsing. Okay. Pantsing being you write by the seat of your pants as opposed to plotting you work it all out in your pants. So it sounds like, do you work it out? I'm a big believer in blending genres. Yes. And I blend writing modes as well. Um, and it makes it hard to know where to put the book on the shelf when you blend genres, but that's what I like to do. And um, 
I, I have a germ of an idea, I have it what I call blocked mm -hmm. out, like in this chapter, which may be one chapter, it may be three chapters, I want this to happen. And I'll have a sentence or two, or a few words. And um, then once I'm into the book, into drafting, I hit a point where the characters take over. Yeah. And from there, it is just pantsing. Because mm -hmm. they always surprise you if they, yeah. they, if, they, if they come to life enough. They do. Do your characters talk to you after you shut down writing for the night? No, they don't. I mean, they keep me awake, uh, in a sense. So. Yeah. But I, I don't know if they're whispering in my ear so much as I'm like, oh, why are you doing that? You're making this book so much harder because like everything was so simple, and then you took a right turn mm -hmm. when I thought you were going to turn left. But. Uh, I notice we have five minutes left, so are there questions in the room? I have two questions. So first, for you, Matt, did you ever find that third grade teacher as an, as an adult uh, later in life as you had established yourself? Mrs. Wiegand has passed away. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, but I had another teacher, um, and I don't know what happened to her. I would love to find yeah. her, uh, freshman year in high school. Yeah. And um, I was writing short stories, and I was really proud of them and should not have been. And <laughs> she agreed to read one. And oh, when I think of what this poor woman <laughs> went through before she had to say to me, Shanae, I know you think this, this was a big event uh, in this story, but there are things worse than smoking cigarettes. <laughs> as she moved up the cigarette. <laughs> so that's my second question for both of you. As teachers, have there been moments where you've, where you've read something from one of your students or one of your people and been like, okay, this, this, is, this is the real, this is the real deal? Oh yeah. Yeah. But I don't know if you've had this experience. Like, there's definitely, I, I've read a lot of work from students, and I'm like, holy smokes, this is amazing. Yeah, okay. But I will say, but then the collision between the success in art and then being a success commercially, yeah. I'm almost never able to predict that. Like, some, uh, yeah. I've, I don't know how many times I've read amazing work yeah. in the classroom and said, like, you go, go sell this, you're going to get an agent, and then it fizzles out. And then something else that maybe I didn't think I thought was good, but I didn't think it was amazing that just races right to the shelf. So it's, it's really hard to predict. Um, it is. And agents have a hard time predicting, right. too. Yeah. I, um, in, a, in a life a few years ago, I thought, I can write YA fiction. So I did. And I got a really hot agent, top agents in the country, uh, for YA. And she was like, this is going to go at auction. It didn't sell at all. Um, yeah. And that was when I moved back to uh, adult fiction. In fact, she wrote me on Christmas Eve and said, don't bother answering this because as soon as I hit send, I am going away for three weeks on vacation. But I'm not sure you're a YA writer. <laughs> I think maybe you need to oh. move back to writing adult fiction. And you know, I had a house full of guests. Yeah. And on Christmas like, Eve. On Christmas Eve. That's I mean, rough. that's just crummy. That's yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, so she said, one of the other agency well, agents in our agency is suggesting that you read Pam Janoff because we think you write somewhat like her. So I did. That's what I spent my holiday doing. And I was like, dang, she was right. I'm mm. not a YA writer. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, to answer the other end of your question, I have also gotten work from students and you're like, where do I begin? <laughs> um, this is, this person wants to tell a story, but they don't know, um, they're putting a metaphor in every single sentence. Mm -hmm. And you're like, uh, <laughs> I can't bear to read more of it. And it's dropping like a stone. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I also get the 
it. The wonderful, wonderful moments of brilliance from writers, and you're like, go for it. This is, cool. it's there, go. I remember once asking an author who visited UWM why she taught. She was a poet uh, of many, many years. And she had this great line. She said, students, they bring us the news. And I thought that was just a wonderful way to put it. And yeah. there's just something, students coming up, younger yeah. writers, they have a sense of the world in themselves, which is always exciting to read uh, and inspiring. I mean, when I'm looking at a student's work, I long ago would say, like, oh, you could fix this. And now I'm really just interested in identifying almost like a heat map, the same way like I know some people looking for the fugitive in the forest who kind of do an infrared radar and see where, and I can almost do the same thing flying over the story, like this is where the heart of your story is, and this is where, this is where the energy is, like invest your time here, because I think this is where you're going. But also giving them the opportunity to say like, no, I don't think so, I think my story's over here, and I was like, go. Go for it. Yeah, because I think that's the great thing about art, it, as, but there may just be one answer to two plus two, or maybe there isn't. But with writing, you can always find a different way around. And that's very exciting to be with them on that journey. It is. And I absolutely agree that working with students, there is a freshness. There is, there is an intelligence there that I don't have at the moment. And I love to get, and I love to see it in in my students, whether they are 85 or they're 19. It's that kind of dynamic just makes my heart sing. Absolutely. Teaching is like hooking jumper cables up to your head, but sometimes you're the recipient of the energy. Exactly. That's so. good. Uh, so kind of following off that, like you both had kind of brought up, being all in on certain things and uh, teaching being a little a little exhausting or jumper cables and so sometimes it's energizing and sometimes it might fry you. Uh, so how do you or what is what are the methods that are effective for you for setting aside that time to be creative and, and write versus That's a good question. I think putting it on the calendar like any other thing, like if I put the doctor's appointment on the calendar, I know I'm gonna go to the doctor. And if I put writing on the calendar then I know I'm gonna do the writing because it's there. It's, it's just making it non negotiable for yourself. Um, because sometimes honoring what's so important to you, sometimes you put yourself last. You know, there's so many different things and kind of competitions for your time. And just I have to remind myself continually really, that I had to put a marker down. Yeah, I, I used to really worry if I wasn't inspired, because I have to start with page one, even though I know every one of my page ones is not going to be the ultimate page one. But I have to have a sense, enough sense of my uh, narrative arc and of my characters and where they're going to get going. And I used to fret endlessly. And now I've gotten to the point where I, I trust the process. And I know that the moment will come to me when I'm ready to write, when I go into what I call writing mode. Yeah. And once I go into writing mode, the life around me falls away. And my husband will periodically come in at 10 o'clock at night and say, are you doing dinner tonight? And I'll say, I need you to know last week. Isn't that enough? <laughs> and I, I literally will put in 14 to 16 hours. Wow. Yeah. And um, so when I'm in writing mode, I, my calendar is just crossed off. Yeah. And uh, unless there's something really, really important in and I'm really grumpy about it. So. Well, thank you. This was a real treat. I really appreciate the library for bringing us here and Blue House Books. And this has been a great opportunity to get to know a fellow author from Southeast Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. Nice. yeah, you've never met before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we've done this a million times. Uh, <laughs> just making that up like a true writer. But thank you. Thanks so much for coming.